Greetings my friends, this is David and welcome back to Almost a Country, a series in which I translate ancient poems, try to make reason of avant-garde manifestos and most importantly try to share with you my love for failed attempts to declare a country. Today we will take a look at the Italian Regency of Carnaro, one of my all-time favorites. Some of the most interesting countries in history happen to be passion projects of a single, determined and idealistic person. Countries whose image is inseparably tied to the persona of their leader, whether failed or successful, always have a certain popular appeal to them. Some could argue it is because these charismatic figures humanize their countries and make them understandable to the common man, in comparison to the no-faced bureaucracy of other countries. Others would dismiss these leaders as nothing more than populists or dictators. Whatever our personal opinion on this topic might be, we must always keep in mind that history is written by the victors, and that for every vilified leader in history, we have one equally adored and praised. For every Adolf Hitler, we have a George Washington. For every Kim Il-sung, we have a Thomas Garrick Masaryk. So far in my series, I have covered people who, while flawed and sometimes controversial, were eventually portrayed in history as bizarre figures, harmless idealists or as well-meaning activists who only sometimes resorted to questionable means. This time we will explore the other side of the spectrum. Despite many a writer or poet in Italian history proudly proclaiming their love and adoration for the mighty Roman Empire and the idea of a unified Italian nation, Italy itself spent most of its past bitterly divided. Ever since the High Middle Ages, Italy was broken into three pieces. The South, controlled by the Kingdom of Sicily and later Naples, the center held by the Papal States, and the north broken into tiny duchies, principalities and city-states, locked into an unending partisan struggle between each other and their nominal landlord, the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. This division is a controversial subject of political debate, and one of the more recent and notable contributors is Professor Gianfranco Milio, one of the founders of Italian federalism and brainfathers of the Italian party Lega Nord, who postulated transforming the centralized Italian Republic into a looser federation of three republics, the North, the Center and the South. Throughout history, men and women of Italy thirsted for unification, often idolizing strong leaders who possessed the means and ambition to mend the fractured leg of Europe. The most vocal of these were people of the written word. Dante Alighieri idolized Henri von Luxembourg. Niccolo Machiavelli idolized Lorenzo di Medici. Adoration for strong leaders and the idea of a unified Italy among prominent literates became somewhat of a running tradition. However, it was not until Victor Emmanuel of Savoy in the 19th century that Italy finally became a unified, independent nation-state for the first time in over a millennium. This event meant extremely much to the general Italian public and led to the birth of the idea that Italy should always exist within its natural borders, no matter what. The year 1914 marked the beginning of the First World War, 
and despite being allied with the Central Powers, Italy initially chose to stay out of the fighting, claiming neutrality. Italian population, however, was deeply divided over this decision, and there were many voices that called for war, specifically war against the Central Powers, in order to reclaim the territories in the northeast at the time held by the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which were still missing from the natural borders claimed by Italy. One of these voices belonged to the famed Italian poet, journalist and playwright Gabriele D'Annunzio. D'Annunzio was born into a rich, presumably noble family and showed signs of literary greatness from an early age. He published his first poetry collection at the age of 16 and regularly wrote newspaper-published reviews and critiques while studying at the La Sapienza University in Rome. And it was during his university years that he began to follow the tradition of all great literates. Passionate and unshakable love for Italy, unified and whole, after a millennium of chaos. D'Annunzio became an esteemed playwright, writing the hit Francesca da Rimini. He became a musical collaborator, helping Claude Debussy with The Martyrdom of Saint Sebastian, which earned him a special place in the Vatican's Index of Forbidden Books. He became a Freemason, eventually rising to become the Grand Master of the Scottish Rite, Great Lodge of Italy. In 1914, D'Annunzio became a public orator, speaking in general public in favour of Italy joining the United Kingdom and France against the Central Powers. In the year 1915, when Italy finally joined the war effort, D'Annunzio became a famous fighter pilot, losing an eye. In 1918, D'Annunzio led an air raid on the Austro-Hungarian capital of Vienna, dropping not bombs, but propaganda leaflets, asking the people of Vienna, and by extension the people of Austria-Hungary, to realize that they hold no influence in the alliance of the Central Powers, instead only following the commands of German generals, and inciting them to demand an end to the fighting. In the year 1918, the war finally ended, and Gabriele D'Annunzio expected the ancient idea of a unified Italy within its natural borders to be fully realized for the first time since the Roman Empire. However, the Paris Peace Conference introduced a new contender for the missing pieces of the Italian puzzle that Austria was giving away. In exchange for joining the war against Austria, Italy was formally promised the full extent of the region north of the Adriatic Sea. The newly created Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes, otherwise known as Yugoslavia, which saw this as ceding over a quarter of the total Slovene population to Italy, protested against this decision. Eventually, the two kingdoms settled on an agreement, and several regions of what should have originally been Italian territory was instead ceded to Yugoslavia, including the ancient Italian port city of Fiume. Fiume, known today as the Croatian city of Rijeka, is a port city in the north of the Adriatic Sea, just east of the Istrian peninsula. In the past, it had a local power rivalry with the Republic of Venice, before being purchased by Habsburg Austria in 1466. By the time of the First World War, vast majority of the city's populace was Italian, and many prominent residents called for autonomy or even complete independence from Austro-Hungarian Empire long before the beginning of the 20th century. By the signing of the Saint Germain Treaty in 1919, the Kingdom of Italy was ready to concede the port city of Fiume 
and its adjacent islands in the Gulf of Karnaro and the land surrounding it to the nascent Yugoslavian realm. Just two days after the treaty was agreed upon, however, something very odd happened. Something none of the logical minds of the diplomats in Paris could comprehend. Art happened. Gabriele D'Annunzio, closely watching the development of Paris peace talks, could not allow for ancient Italian land to fall in the hands of barbarians when Italy was so close to being whole again. On the 12th of September 1919, Gabriele D'Annunzio arrived at Fiume at the head of 2600 volunteer soldiers and took the city. From today's point of view, we would say he was a seditious terrorist. But consider the era D'Annunzio lived in. From a poet's point of view, the world was changing for the worse. The Belle Epoque ended. The values of chivalry, adventure, virtues and morality of the previous centuries, all of those were in heavy decline with the coming of the 20th century and it seemed that no one but the artists took notice. They saw the world losing its beauty, its magic, the wonder of adventure and exploration, becoming a boring place of coldness, finance and industry. Things may be useful to the common man, but ever so destructive for a creative and innovative mind of a poet. In response to these changes, the decadent artistic movement formed, of which D'Annunzio was a strong proponent. From D'Annunzio's point of view, he was doing something that would be acceptable in the old world, that he saw was the right one. From his point of view, he was presenting Victor Emmanuel III, the King of Italy, with an opportunity to both fulfill his obligation to the Treaty of Saint Germain and keep Fiume at the same time. By capturing Fiume for the king, but not being under anyone's direct orders and having support of the majority of Fiume's population, the king never actually violated the treaty. Second half of D'Annunzio's plan was to subsequently offer the captured territory for Italy to annex. However, the world has changed enough by this point for this part of his plan to fail. The king, Victor Emmanuel III, formally refused to annex Fiume, and D'Annunzio was left alone in no man's land to his own devices. Alone against the cold and changed world which was now closely watching what happens next in Fiume. Enraged by the king's response to his efforts, he decided to become the man in his no man's land. And if Italy would not have this land, then he would turn this land into his own Italy. One that would stand for the values he saw the world was lacking. Italian Regency of Carnaro was born, of which D'Annunzio was the Duke and Commander. It took for its name the Italian name of the Adriatic Gulf that Fiume was presiding over. Today's Croatian name for it is the Kvarnjer Gulf. In the matter of a few months, intellectuals, artists, philosophers, writers and musicians felt the calling of Fiume, and all accepted D'Annunzio's invitations to join him on his journey towards a better future. The goal was to make the humanity better, and these men were there to help D'Annunzio see it through. Alceste de Ambris, renowned Italian syndicalist and political theorist, who became D'Annunzio's chief of staff. Leon Kochnitsky, Belgian revolutionary socialist poet, author of D'Annunzio's later international organization. Guido Keller, eccentric Italian celebrity war hero, ace pilot, pirate, nudist and yoga lover, who became minister of action in D'Annunzio's new country and was famous for sleeping naked in the treetops of Fiume, along with his pet eagle. Henry First, American journalist and playwright, 
who became Carnaro's foreign secretary. Giovanni Comiso, later famous Italian writer, who became Fumes, occult Hinduistic guru and yoga instructor. Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, Italian art theorist and the founder of Futurism. Ferruccio Vecchi, Marinetti's friend and provocative Italian sculptor. This is just the selection of those figures who had an influence on the later development of Italian Regency of Carnaro. In actuality, the influx of artists and thinkers brought hundreds upon hundreds of avant-garde intellectuals to Fiume, one more eccentric than the other. Fiume was to become the ultimate sociological experiment. Combining the virtues of the ancient Romans, progressivity of the countless avant-garde schools of thought, and the mystical aesthetics of occultism and Masonic poets. The ultimate concept art performance, if you will. With his whole squad ready to rumble, Gabriele and the boys got down to business. Alceste de Ambris and D'Annunzio himself had the task of creating the Charter of Carnaro, the new Regency's constitution. It is a peculiar document quite unlike anything written before or since, its uniqueness coming from the, for the time, very radical syndicalist view of Alceste de Ambris and D'Annunzio's poetic mind and reverence for Roman imperialism. The ideas that Carnaro pioneered were most notably full, active, universal voting right for every citizen and corporativism, dividing the entire population into corporations based on their career lines that worked similarly to a trade union. Moreover, it presented music, aestheticity of public spaces and ecstasy of life as integral pillars of statehood. I could talk about its contents for hours, but nothing I can say truly expresses what the document itself does. I encourage you to read the entire document, to which I provided a link in the description to this video. What De Ambris helped D'Annunzio implement on a local scale, Leon Kochnitsky intended to spread around the world. The Belgian poet became the architect of a grand concept of an international organization that would unite all the repressed, underrepresented, discriminated nations of the world, to whom the great international powers and the League of Nations, the United Nations of the day, were unwilling to listen to. D'Annunzio saw the League of Nations as a forum where the strong can use their positions to uphold unfavorable status quo at the expense of the weak, exploiting them in the name of peace. Not unlike the view many people share about the contemporary United Nations. This was a subtle nod to the fact that the fate of Fiume was decided between Italians, Yugoslavs and the French without taking the wishes of the majority of the population for autonomy into account. The new organization was coined the League of Fiume, and according to its creators, Kochnitsky and D'Annunzio, it was to be an anti-League of Nations. Immediately, the new League sent its envoys to countries such as Ireland, India, Egypt, recently reformed Hungary, Turkey, or Soviet Russia, still recovering from a civil war and generally unrecognized. Thus, the League of Fiume became known as less of an international forum and more of an alliance of guerrilla groups and insurgents. One of the main membership incentives was the sale of weapons and ammunition. In 1920, the League agreed to supply quarter of a million rifles to Egyptian rebels. Supposedly, the members of the Irish Republican Army visited Fiume to negotiate a similar deal. The League also supplied tremendous amounts of arms and ammunition to a number of separatist cells, 
aiming to break apart Fiume's new eastern neighbor, Yugoslavia. Perhaps the greatest accomplishment of the League is mutual recognition of statehood between the Italian Regency of Carnaro and Soviet Russia. Carnaro was the first country to have recognized the Soviets, the latter being the only country to recognize Carnaro. Lenin also called D'Annunzio the only other true revolutionary in the world. A grand conference of the League was planned on May 1920, however it never happened, due to dark clouds gathering over the horizon of the Gulf of Carnaro. Before tackling on the reason why the conference never took place, I feel it necessary to tell you more about what was living under the Regency actually like. Day-to-day -day life was defined by two major factors, one internal and one external. The first came in the form of Denuncio's 2600 legionnaires and the world intellectuals his project attracted enough to move to Fiume. The focus of public lifestyle shifted from the common citizenry to modern thinkers, writers and artists, many of them being radically aligned with one or another post-World War I philosophy. Communists could be found attending the same parties as fascists, Buddhists, pacifists and revolutionaries would coexist in neighboring apartments, every one of them being outspoken and extravagant, confident in the thought that by coming to Fiume, they are going to steer the world in a direction of their choosing. Perhaps the most interesting group that went from fringe to mainstream in Fiume was Arditism. Arditism could be perhaps called a lifestyle, although its value definition is somewhat loose. It stems from the values upheld by Italian stormtrooper forces, dubbed the Arditi, meaning the brave. Back during the World War I, the Arditi would be given special strike tasks behind enemy lines, often with very low survival expectancy. To be fast and maneuverable on the battlefield, they would storm enemy positions without any equipment, often entirely naked, with grenades in both hands and a combat knife between their teeth. They gained a reputation as being men without anything to lose who supported their apparent fearlessness with cocaine and other drugs in order to be able to wreak havoc in enemy trenches more efficiently. Most of Denuncio's volunteers came from the ranks of RDT veterans, and their lifestyle of living fast, in the moment, to life's fullest, without much regard for consequences became something of a genius loci in Fiume. Arditism recognized the world changing for the worse, just as Denuncio did when he designed his new country. It represented the wish of capturing the adventure of life, of finding excitement and magic in a world that was slowly losing it. Under these internal influences, life in Fiume became something of a never-ending party that goes on until everybody burns out and dies of exhaustion. People were founding philosophy discussion groups and experimental art studios every day, and attending wild raves and orgies every night. This environment suited very well most thinkers and artists in Fiume, most of whom joined a social group named Union of Free Spirits Tending Towards Perfection, also nicknamed Yoga. This group dedicated itself to the study of Hinduism attaining spiritual aristocracy and a utopian society based on rural lifestyle that would restore the ways of life of times past. To recapture the magic of the world, so to say. The yoga group was also divided into several subgroups. The members of the Brown Lotus were dedicated to the idea of leading a simple life and return to nature. The members of the Red Lotus were avid nudists and proclaimed the arrival of a new world, transfigured by a renewed sexuality, who would regularly hold bisexual sex training workshops for public. 
There was another group which declared themselves to be disciples of an undefined and unattained sacred love. Leon Kochnitsky wrote, It was the ball of the burning. One's gaze, wherever it fixed, saw a dance. Of lanterns, of sparks, of stars, starving in ruin, in anguish. Perhaps on the verge of death in the flames, or under a hail of grenades. Fiume, brandishing a torch, danced before the sea. While very accommodating to the radical intellectuals living under its banner, this lifestyle was quickly too much for the common people living in the regency of Carnaro. To add to the citizenry's suffering, in the year 1920 a shift in Italy's approach to the new country occurred. While Italian government was previously content with leaving the situation silently play out, confident that one ally or another will take care of it, the new plan was to oust Denuncio from Fiume for good and by force, and enforce the agreement with the Yugoslavians forged during the Paris peace talks. Italian ground forces would be deployed near their border with the Regency, putting a stranglehold on the trade over land. But with Fiume being a port city, the Italian naval blockade proved to be much more destructive. Danunzio's poetocracy suddenly found itself cut off from the means to sustain itself. Given Danunzio's war hero status and immense popularity in the military, the new liberal government in Rome had feared that should they order their soldiers to attack Danunzio's legionnaires, their own soldiers would either refuse to obey or outright revolt. So, the government instead hoped to intimidate the people of Fiume enough for them to revolt and drive Denuncio and company out of their city in a desperate bid to lift the siege and save their families from death by starvation, without the Italian armed forces having to fire a shot. However, this was the new, boring world thinking. In Denuncio's magical world of adventure, there was a solution to this problem. This solution was Guido Keller. Danunzio's fellow eccentric war hero and minister of action. He was put in command of the Regency's navy and army with a single task. Help the Utopia survive. The ground troops crossed borders into Italy, stealing horses and cattle from farmsteads in the borderlands and military equipment from Italian bases and from soldiers sent to blockade the land trade. It is said that Danunzio's course was initially so popular among the Italian military that the soldiers didn't even try to stop his men from taking their guns and ammunition. The navy, under Keller's personal oversight, started conducting pirate raids. Keller started to call his sailors Usochi, after a group of medieval privateers. They launched raids against warships of the Italian blockade for weapons and against merchant ships for food and other vital supplies. Keller during this time, as head of the Regency's navy, started to pose for photographs as the Greek god of the seas, Poseidon. Keller, being primarily a pilot, tried to use what limited aerial forces he had at his disposal to do some good for Fiume. One time he flew his plane to an Italian farm, where he stole a pig and return with it to the city. Another time he flew all the way to Rome, where he dropped bouquets of flowers down onto the Vatican as a sign of appreciation for the Catholic Church, and a potty full of turnips and carrots onto the Italian Chamber of Deputies, along with the message to the Parliament and Government based on lies and fear, the allegorical embodiment of their values. The Italian Regency of Carnaro managed to survive thanks to these actions, but not even the absolute mad lad that was Guido Keller could forage enough food and medical supplies for everyone. In a desperate situation, Danunzio ordered scores of babies and children of Fiume and families to be spirited away to Italy and given away for adoption, in order to save them from the siege. 
whatever popularity Danuncio's dream country had among the common citizens of Fiume, it was virtually lost by this point. Even worse for the poet, the wildly divergent ideologies of the host of modern intellectuals who came to support his plans finally began to show just how incompatible with each other they were. Radical leftists and conservative wings started to form and Danuncio was placed in a position where he had to choose one of them and alienate the other, while infuriating the common citizens of Fiume by choosing anybody. The atmosphere around the good poet began to feel cutthroat. Italian government found the opening they were hoping for. With Fiume suddenly overflowing with discord, the kingdoms of Italy and Yugoslavia signed the Treaty of Rapallo in November 1920. The treaty recognized the desire of the Fiumans to remain independent, provided they will also be independent of Denuncia. At the treaty's signing in Rapallo, the new free state of Fiume was declared with official statehood recognition made by France, the United Kingdom, the United States, as well as the treaty's original signatories already attached. To the citizens of Fiume, this seemed to be a win-win scenario. They get to keep the independence that Danuncio won for them, and they also get to get rid of him, because the presence of him, his friends and their radical and eccentric ideas of a new world were simply too much. The free state of Fiume, however, came with strings attached, and we will discuss its fate in another video. Gabriele D'Annunzio immediately announced his disagreement with this new treaty, and declared that if Italy wishes him to leave, they will have to make him leave by force. Enraged, he had the Italian regency of Carnaro declare war on its spiritual motherland an act that would greatly undermine his popularity with the Italian armed forces, who now had no qualms with starting assault on Fiume. On the Christmas day of 1920, Marshal Enrico Caviglia, perhaps the most decorated officer of the time, launched an assault on the poetic utopia. After five days of fighting between Italian regulars and the Regency's Arditi veterans, Fiume fell to Caviglia's troops. Finally, Italian battleships shelled D'Annunzio's residence in Fiume, forcing him to concede defeat and surrender. He, along with the men and women who supported his cause, found themselves broken, bitter and disillusioned. While Carnaro was a home to none of them, they suddenly felt exiled from their homeland. And perhaps they were, even if it wasn't in the literal sense. The Regency wasn't a country built for a nation. It wasn't born out of a natural geographical occurrence. It was a country built for the citizens of the old magical world, untainted by the bleakness and mediocrity of the new industrial era and a world that stopped seeing the value of individuality and instead promoted mass production and court accounting. The American poet Ezra Pound said that D'Annunzio is to be admired, for in a world of airplanes, machine guns, factories and corporations, he followed his poet's heart and created his own Italy when the original one changed too much. And D'Annunzio's case is certainly one we cannot really judge by rational and pragmatic standards, as we would most other dictators, because his actions weren't motivated by a simple ideology or by any selfish desire for power. From this world's point of view, he is difficult to understand because this world was exactly what he fought against. It may sound a little cliched, but those 15 months in Fiume were to some extent a metaphor. In the end, the question we should be asking isn't was D'Annunzio's cause a just one, or was D'Annunzio a bad person for doing what he did? The question we really should be asking is is it still worth to us to dream of a utopia? And if so, 
do we have any right to build it? D'Annunzio and his actions spark controversies and debate to this day. The topic of his regency is a very complex one, and it took a full year to compile into a roughly 30 minutes long video. Because of that, I decided I wanted the next episode of Almost a Country to tell the story of perhaps the most inconsequential country in history. A country about which a video would be about five minutes long and could be released in a couple of weeks. A country that did in fact exist for several centuries, but only because nobody remembered or noticed it existed. The Republic of Senarica. Thank you.